reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Old Testament prophet Ezekiel follows Jeremiah. The title of the message is Certain Judgment. The year is about 592 BC. God has consistently warned Jerusalem that unless she turns from idolatry, God is going to send her into captivity and he has Jeremiah in Jerusalem bringing that message. We saw that in the book of Jeremiah. He has Ezekiel in Babylon, the captor, the captivating uh, nation, has uh, taken them into captivity at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar, and Ezekiel is a Jewish prophet and a priest, and he is there in Babylon telling of the forecoming doom of Jerusalem. Now, if we just read this as history, it's interesting, but we read it also for application in our lives. Uh, I don't have any idols in my house to Baal or to Molech or to Ashtart or Semiramis or anybody else. I have none of those uh, idols in my family. So how does this book speak to me? Well, what is an idol? If you look it up in the dictionary, well, the first definition of an idol is going to be a statue of some sort, but read the second definition and the third. It has to do with the fact that an idol can be anything or anyone which takes the place of God. So this speaks to our hearts today. No, there's no physical idol in my family, but what about the idol in my own heart? How about self? Is self a competing idol with God? putting myself first, did it my way kind of a mentality. So we need to check ourselves out. Lord, is there any idol in my life, anything or anyone which is keeping me from you? And the test is very easy. Am I satisfied with my walk with God, with my prayer life? Am I bringing the tithe into the storehouse, the 10% that God says is mine, the very first tenth that you get? Am I spending time serving God, helping people? Am I worshiping him? Am I loving him, praying to him? Am I satisfied that I'm right where I should be? If not, what is keeping me from being where I should be? That might be the idol in my life. Lord, help me to identify it and tear it down. Well, let's see what today what's going to happen. We're going to see in chapter 12 that uh, Judah's captivity is portrayed. God is going to portray through this prophet how he's going to capture uh, the nation of uh, Judah. Uh, chapter 13, he's going to talk about false prophets, those who give us false messages that are not from God, uh, especially the fact that God's not going to judge you because you do wrong. The world likes to believe that nonsense. Chapter 14, judgment on idolatry. And God is going to judge idolatry for them, and he'll judge idolatry in our lives. He will take that which takes the place of him and remove it. And it can be a person a place, a thing. Chapter 15, the fruitless vine. God is looking for fruit from Israel. He's looking for fruit from you and me. If he can't find fruit, what's he going to do? What do you do with broken twigs? Well, now you have to bag them up for the trash man to come by. But when I was young, you took those broken twigs and you put them out in the lawn. And what did you do? You burned them, right? So uh, we're going to look at certain judgment. We want to avoid God's judgment and tell others to avoid judgment as well. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to open your word for us now. Help us to really understand it, really get excited about it, be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 12 of uh, the book of Ezekiel. Let's begin with Judah's captivity uh, now being portrayed by him. Uh, we're going to see that God's going to affirm the judgment uh, with a sign of baggage. Uh, you know, the kids downstairs 
uh, are not going to be handling this kind of a study too much. They're going to have uh, aids and helps. They're going to have uh, chalkboards and they're going to have games and they're going to have books and, and crafts and things. And they're going to identify by those methods. Sometimes we need something more symbolic. In fact, we just went through something symbolic known as communion. The bread and the cup portrays the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. So we need these tangible physical signs to understand God's message at times. And now he's going to say to the prophet, I want you to give a picture to the people to make them curious, ask them what's going on, and then I will teach through that. Chapter 12 of Ezekiel, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see and ears to hear but does not hear for they are a rebellious house. Judah was rebellious. They were worshiping their idols instead of Jehovah and you and I are rebellious when we don't follow God but follow our own ways. We have eyes, eyes to see the Lord, hear him with our ears but we don't use it for that. We are simply deaf to him and blind to him. And that's when he has to deal with us. Therefore, son of man, here's what he has to do now to give a little play to pique their interest and drive home the point that God has. Prepare your belongings for captivity and go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from your place into captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider though they are a rebellious house. By day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight, as though going into captivity, and at evening you shall go in their sight like those who go into captivity. So the first thing he has to do is get his knapsack, get his baggage, whatever, and start putting his belongings in it. Can you imagine being married to this guy? <laughs> and his wife saying, what are you doing? You're packing all your things up, honey? Are you moving out? I'm moving out. I'll be back tonight, and tomorrow I'll move out again. He has to pack all his belongings, and he has to schlep them, as the Yiddish would say, to a certain location, and then he's going to schlep them back. And they're naturally going to say, Ezekiel, what are you doing? So today, if I had to do this, if I got my belongings together, I got a couple of bags from the attic and took all my belongings there, my wife would get nervous maybe. But if I got all my things and uh, started, started going down the street in Del Mar, where I live, people would say, Jerry, what are you doing? Actually, they probably wouldn't pay attention to me at all there, but uh, in any event, hopefully someone would say, what are you doing? Well, I'm picturing captivity if we do not obey the Lord. And what are they going to say to me? Uh, call 911 and have them hauled away, probably, right? But uh, it was to pique their interest to show them God is going to take the people in Israel, in Judah, in captivity. Now, verse 5, he's got another uh, way he has to pique their interest. Dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out through it. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulders and carry them out at twilight, that's at night. You shall cover your face so you cannot see the ground, for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. So he's going to have to dig a hole in the wall. Now he's got to get a hammer, he's got to get a chisel, he's going to have to make a hole big enough for himself to crawl through. Well, naturally they're going to say, what are you doing, Ezekiel? And it's a picture of what's going to happen in the final conquest when Nebuchadnezzar in 586 breaks the walls of Jerusalem and the king, Zedekiah, tries to escape from the city. He and his nobles will try to sneak out the back, leave the people behind, and uh, he's now saying this is a picture of what's going to happen in a few years. So all of this is what God sees. God sees the future, and he is now giving a sign for them. Notice that phrase in verse 6, I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. Does that apply to my life today? Am I a sign? The Bible doesn't say for us to witness, although we do want to share our faith, and we call it witnessing, but the Bible says you are a witness. People are watching you. They're watching me. Are we Christians? Are we not? How are we behaving? We are a sign. And as you and I are living in righteousness and holiness and the purity of God, God is making us a sign for those to see. Well, verse 7. These may be the most important words in all the Bible. So I did as I was commanded. That is the secret to the Christian life. Also, that's a secret for getting 
by in school successfully, helps to keep your job, helps to keep you married, helps to keep you in society, do as you are commanded. I learned that when I married the most beautiful young lady in the world a little over three years ago. Um, the Lord said, all you need to have is two sets of two words, Sherry. It's not that hard. At the ceremony, just simply say, I do. And I did say, I do. And he says, after that, just two more words. Yes, dear. Right? And it's, it's been working very well for me. Been working very well. Oh, I, I do sometimes protest, and I demand, and I command, and I indicate what's going to happen, but in the final analysis, yes, dear, always works. So he did what he was commanded. That's the secret of the Christian life. Do as you're commanded. You'll never, ever be in trouble. So I brought my belongings by day as though going into captivity. At evening, I dug through the wall with my hand. I brought them out at twilight, and I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. So he did what he was supposed to be doing. That could be very wearisome, very tiresome, uh, sometimes very monotonous, but you know, serving the Lord is not always wine and roses and lots of fun. Sometimes it's daily drudgery, but that faithfulness is going to pay off and people are watching you. I'm sure he didn't have a, a grumbly attitude or a complaining attitude, oh, this load is so heavy, I'm so tired of digging through that wall. He did it apparently with joy, at least by a sense of uh, willingness. And you and I must not live our lives complaining or being critical of God or saying, why is this my lot? I was talking to two men this morning as we were walking my dogs. And uh, the consensus as we were sharing our lives over the last several months was even though there are downturns and difficulties, it could be worse. Don't complain. Just have the joy of the Lord. My late mother used to say, be careful lest a fate worse than this befall you. Translated, it could get a whole lot worse, honey. Stop your complaining and rejoice. Well, verse 8, in the morning the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? And that was the whole point of these plays. What's going on, Ezekiel? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am assigned to you. As I have done, so it shall be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. That's referring to the king. They shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. He shall cover his face so he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will also spread my net over him. He shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. I will scatter to every wind all who are around him to help him and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, from famine, from pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. That's the whole bottom line. I want them to know that I am God and I am to be worshipped. So notice that Ezekiel, and we're in chapter 12 of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel was going through this uh, burden of carrying his belongings, digging through the wall, and he had to do that without even knowing why. But after he was obedient and took that first step, then God told him what to say. And he told him, you're to tell them this is what the prince is going to do. God does not even call him the king. He just calls him the prince. Uh, he, he, he really demotes him because to God he's not acting like a king. And he's going to try to escape from the uh, enemy. So he's going to dig through the wall in the middle of the night. And so what you're portraying here is going to take place really in just about 10 years. A couple of lessons that I can learn from this. When God says to do something, don't wait for the full explanation if he doesn't want to offer it, do it. If he says take step one, do it. Once you take step one and you need step two, you're gonna get step two. But oftentimes we say, I'm not gonna go till I get the whole plan. Well, we don't want to wait for the whole plan. You might not like it <laughs> or might not have the faith to believe for it. Do what God has told you to do, step by step. And then as you take the first step and you're faithful, he will teach you the second step. It's kind of like raising kids downstairs. 
You take a five-year-old and you say, now we're going to have lunch at noon, and then at two o'clock we're going to do this, and at five o'clock that, and tomorrow we're going to pay the mortgage, and Tuesday like, you're going to lose the kid. How do you take care of kids? How do you teach them? One step at a time. When I was in the army, guess how much they told me? <laughs> Not very much. Just enough that you have to do what you're supposed to do. Especially when we were in combat, especially in the height of the war, you are given orders and you take those orders. If they told you too much, you would want to run and hide. You just do what you're supposed to do. That's the success in the Christian life. When he says do it, you do it. If you need step two, you will get step two. Again, Mother had a wonderful saying. As far as what to know for the future, what to do, you will know what you need to know when you need to know it, not before. And you will do what you need to do when you need to do it. Why would he tell you to do something that you're going to do tomorrow? Because tomorrow hasn't even come yet, and it might never come. You just do what you're supposed to do. Well, he then says here, I want them to know that I'm God, and I want you to do this testimony in front of the people, and I'll keep a few people left uh, after this captivity, and they'll be scattered to the winds to tell the Gentiles that I am God. Well, verse 17 now talks about the um, sign of trembling. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, eat your bread while trembling or quaking, drink your water with trembling and anxiety, and say to the people, Thus says the Lord God to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the land of Israel, They shall eat their bread with anxiety, drink their water with dread, so their land will be emptied of all who are in it because of the violence of those who dwell in it. So they're going to be on the run for those who live. They're going to be afraid. They're going to be in a foreign land, and they're going to eat their food and drink their drink with trembling and with fear. Um, we all love our meals. It's probably the high spot of our day for most of us to have a good meal. If we can have one, you like to enjoy it. You like to be peaceful. You like not to have arguing and complaining at the table uh, or, or fear about some situation in your life. But he can't do that. He has to indicate that those who are in captivity are going to have to eat and drink with fear and trembling. So now we get into chapter 13. He's going to give a woe to the false prophets. While God is using Jeremiah in Israel, and he's using Ezekiel in Babylon to tell the true word of God, Satan is there fueling false prophets to say, there's nothing to worry about, there's not going to be any captivity, God loves you, just keep on doing what you're doing. Well, same today. There are those who say that God is watching, and he's giving us grace, but there is a day of accountability. And there's those who say, no, there is no God, or he's a God of love, uh, and uh, this is not going to happen. And so we've got people who are false prophets, as well as the true prophets. Now, he's going to rebuke the false prophets. Look at verses 1 to 16. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of the Lord. Notice that out of their own heart. We like to read the Bible sometimes out of our own heart. Well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm special. Uh, maybe it applies to somebody else, but God's not going to do that to me. I can sin and there'll be no penalty for it. Uh, the other guy gets caught, but I'm not going to get caught. I'm special. I, I do it in the dark. God can't see in the dark. We uh, prophesy out of our own hearts. We try to turn things around for our own advantage. So the Lord says in verse 3, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. So they're prophesying out of their own hearts. They're following their own spirits. They're not hearing from God. And they have seen nothing. That's a picture of man without God. That's a picture of us as we backslide, as we sin and do what we want to do. We go our own way. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. No home, no stability, you just wander in your roam. You have no sense of commitment, no sense of devotion to God. So he goes on to say, verse 6, they've envisioned futility, false divination. Thus says the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. They speak some word and hope it's going to be true, but God hasn't sent them. That's important for God to send you. 
when, you, when God doesn't send you, you're wasting your time. I like to say that on a good day with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all of the world praying for you, serving God can be very difficult. But when you try to take on a task that God hasn't given you, break up a church, cause a church split, try to lead people in a different direction and find that God's not in it, that ministry's gonna fail. It's gonna fall. Nothing's gonna come of it. Whatever that situation is, Lord, I wanna be in your will doing what you want. Remember what I said before about uh, verse seven of chapter 12, I did as I was commanded. So ask yourself, am I doing what God's commanding? This ministry, this business, this marriage, this whatever, am I doing what God has told me to do? If not, we don't get divorced. We stay with the marriage and work things out. But, uh, God's, but uh, don't do a thing without God leading you directly. Now he goes on to say now in verse 8, Because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who envision futility, who divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, nor be written in the record of the word of the house of Israel. Again, you'll know that I am the Lord God. They've been saying peace, verse 10, when there is no peace. One builds a wall, they plaster it with untempered mortar. So there are those who are saying everything's fine. God's not going to bring us to accountability. And they say peace when really there is no peace. God is not happy with us. That's a lack of peace. And what they do is they try to uh, plaster a wall with untempered mortar. What does that mean? There's no strength to it. It's going to just fall apart. It's just going to crumble. Uh, it's just like, like a whitewash. You get a wall that's got moisture in it that's starting to crumble. You see the, it begins to, to have uh, a little bulging in it. Next begins to, you touch it, it begins to fall apart. Eh, let's put some paint over it. Everything's going to be fine. That's untempered, and it's never going to work. So when there's sin, you don't just paint over it. You go to a doctor's office, and you complain about a pain, and there's something that's not quite right, and uh, there's discoloration, or there's severe pain, uh, or other signs, and the doctor says, well, take an aspirin and come on back in six months, and we'll look at it. That would be like untempered mortar. That would not help. You'd have to go to somebody else. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a poor diagnosis. My mother, before she died, uh, complained of back pain. She went to a local hospital, and they did all the tests. They said, we don't see what it is, but it's probably a UTI, urinary tract infection. Take the medication. You'll be fine. Took the medication. Nothing happened. The pain was still severe. Went back to the same emergency room. Big mistake. Uh, same diagnosis, different doctor, UTI. Pain was still bad. So after about a week, I said, let's try another hospital. Went to another hospital, a bigger one. And um, I said, now please don't prescribe for UTIs. We've been there and done that. Emergency room was packed. The whole emergency room had one doctor to take care of them. He prescribed, guess what? It must be for UTI. And uh, we went upstairs. She spent the whole weekend, had a lovely roommate whom she got to be good friends with. They did nothing for her. On the way out, discharging the discharging doctor said, even though you're being discharged, you might want to bring her as an outpatient over to check and see maybe there is a fracture in the back or something like that. Said, good idea. Went over, had her x-rayed the next day. She had broken a bone when she fell off the chair in the kitchen. That's what was bothering her. Poor diagnosis. Finally got it right. Of course, once they found out there was a fracture back there and toward the tailbone, they couldn't do anything for it anyway, but at least she knew what it was. So uh, uh, doctors, nurses have to have a sense of getting to the root cause of things to find out what's right. God, the same way, says, let's get the root cause right. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm sinning. I'm do well, yes, those symptoms are wrong. We should cease that. But what's the underlying cause? I I'm drinking too much. I'm doing uh, uh, opiates. I'm, uh, I'm doing all sorts of uh, abuse of the internet. Well, those things are wrong and we should stop. But what's underneath it? Well, let's get to the underlying cause. And so whether it's medicine or whether it's psychiatry or what have you, we need to get to the underlying cause, which is always in some way rooted to uh, sin and our own self-action. But let's get it corrected. So they were, not, they were just covering it over. The problem was they were not worshiping God. They were not putting God first. And so as we put God first, then we get to the root cause, and then the other things will take care of themselves. All right? 
Let's go on and uh, see how they're just going ahead and plastering this wall. They're covering it up. Verse 17, likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who prophesy. Now, these are the women uh, who are prophesying falsely. They prophesy out of their own heart, prophesy against them. And say, thus says the Lord God, woe to the women who sew magic charms on their sleeves, make veils for the heads of people uh, of every height to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and keep yourselves alive? That's a very scary phrase. Very scary. What does that mean to hunt souls? That is the work of the devil. God wants to hunt our souls for salvation. The devil wants to hunt our souls for destruction leading us away from God, hunting our souls, capturing our souls, and leading us into a life without God. And so there are those out there who are hunting souls legitimately for the Lord, sharing the gospel, the good news. But there are those who are hunting souls, keeping us away from the word, keeping us away from God. Uh, and sometimes they're in the pulpits. Sometimes they're in the pews. Sometimes they're in the politics, leading us away from the Lord. Anyone who tries to lead us away from God and his word is hunting souls for the devil. We need to be aware of it and avoid it. Verse 19, And will you profane me among my people for handfuls of barley and pieces of bread, killing people who should not die, keeping people alive who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to lies? So they were giving out false messages for bread and for barley. The pulpits are filled with pastors who are bringing forth the word of God, the true word of God. But there are also pulpits where there are pastors who are telling people what they want to hear. I want to give you a nice message, make you have a happy ending on this, this sermon so that you will like me and keep me in office and keep my salary up there. I won't tell you the truth because my job security is more important than telling the true word of God. That's the attitude of many of them. Thank God most of the pastors are giving the true word of God, but there are some who are just selling their souls for a handful of barley or pieces of bread. So God is against those magic charms. Verse 20, those magic charms were conjuring up demonic spirits. Um, those magic charms by which you hunt souls, they're like birds or flying ones. I will tear them from your arms and let the souls go, the souls you hunt like birds. And so there is some kind of magical, uh, demonic way they were worshiping the devil. And um, they, uh, th these magic charms somehow caused the demons to fly. When you look at a scene of Hallow Halloween or some kind of a horror film, often you see black creatures flying in the background like crows or what have you. That's the idea here. I will tear off your veils and deli deliver the people out of your hand. They shall no longer be prey in your hand. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, verse 21 is good. Let's read that again. I will tear off your veils and deliver my people out of your hand. They shall no longer be as prey in your hand. Do you have a sister who's not saved? A brother? A parent? A child? And the devil has that person? Oh, Jerry, the devil doesn't have them. That person just doesn't know the Lord. If they don't know the Lord, the devil has them. We need to pray for that person to be free. That person is a prey in the hands of the evil one, and we need to pray. I get up in the morning, my wife goes right to her prayer chair, she begins to pray for the family, uh, the nation, uh, the world, and uh, she prays for those who seem to be backslidden, not serving the Lord, uh, and she treats it as though the devil has them under control and commands they be released. So that's how she's applying this, that they are no longer going to be prey in the hands of the evil one. Lord, release my daughter, release my son, release my brother, release the president, the mayor, the governor, whoever, in the name of Jesus. Why? So they can know that I am the Lord, God says. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, you've strengthened the hands of the wicked, so he does not turn from the wicked way to save his life. Therefore you shall no longer envision futility nor practice divination, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So pray for your unloved ones or loved ones who don't know the Lord to be delivered, to be set free. 
Don't treat them as just idle little bumps on the log who don't care about the Lord. Treat them as captives, captives who the devil has deceived, who's, uh, who they're, they're, they're bound to themselves, to their own ways, their own will. Uh, command to the devil to set them free by the blood of Jesus Christ. Chapter 14, judgment on idolatry. God is going to judge idolatry, and again, idolatry is anything that takes the place of God. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. See, they came to hear from God. God would not speak in those days through the Holy Spirit inside each person. He spoke through the prophets. So the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. So now we're not talking about a statue. We're talking about the idol of their own hearts. And put them... And put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? So these guys have got idolatry problems. And they want to hear from me. Should I talk to them? Therefore speak to them and say, thus says the Lord God. Everyone of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart. And puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity. And then comes to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. You want to hear from me? I'll answer you in accordance with your idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. You see our idolatry keeps us from hearing from God? Why can't I hear from God? I'm asking for direction about my life. Uh, uh, I'm single and want to get married. I, have a, I want to get a job change. I want to move into a different location. But I just don't get any answers at all from God. It's as though he doesn't exist or he thinks I don't exist. Well, that's the time to pray David's prayer. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What is blocking me, Lord, from the peace that I need to know that I am right with you? Is there an idol there that needs to be removed? Well, what's the answer? Look at verse 6. God says, repent. Turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. The idols of your life, turn away. Do not look at them. For anyone of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb. I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord." What does it mean to cut off? That's a euphemism meaning put to death. So idolatry is not to be tolerated, God said. If that person comes to me with idols in his heart and wants direction, I'll give him the direction. I'll put, I'll put him in an end to his life. That'll be it. That's how serious it is because it leads us into iniquity to fight all those idols. Well, verse 9, if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet. I'll stretch out my hand against him, destroy him from among my people. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired. So they're all going to have to pay that price. Now, he wants to talk in verse 12 about a judgment on persistent unfaithfulness when we uh, will not give in. We just continue to be unfaithful. Now the word of the Lord came again to him, verse 13, son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, cut off man and beast from it. And even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their unrighteousness, says the Lord God. So when the land is unfaithful, I'm going to deal with that land. They're, gonna, they're not going to get any rain. They're not going to have any bread. There's going to be a famine in that land. And I don't care who comes and tries to intercede. Take the three most faithful men for intercession in the Old Testament. Noah, an example to his nation when he built the ark. Daniel, 
They're in captivity in Babylon and Job, who had to pray for his friends. I don't care who intercedes. I will not hear. And I'll cause the wild beasts to pass through that land. They'll empty it. And so we need to make sure in our lives that the idols are removed. Otherwise, I don't care who's praying for you. God is saying there'll be a famine. Oh, maybe you can still go to the store and buy your groceries. But there's going to be a famine of peace. You're not going to feel God's peace. A famine of relationships when families are arguing with each other. A famine of a job when you're suddenly canned. Uh, you walk into work the next day and you're fired. And uh, you wonder what happened. Well, God is bringing a famine to catch your attention. Verse 17, I might bring a sword on the land. The sword can go through that land. I'll cut off man and beast. Even though these three men were still there to intercede, I'm not going to hear them. Verse 19, if I send a pestilence unto that land and pour out my fury, uh, and that even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were there as I live, I would deliver them, but I would not deliver those who are unrighteous. So thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, famine, wild beast, pestilence, to cut off man and beast from it. Yet behold, there shall be left in it a remnant. Oh, that's worth underlining. God always has a remnant, the faithful few. May you be that faithful few who will be brought out, sons and daughters. Surely they'll come out to you and you will see their ways and their doings. And then you'll be comforted concerning the disaster that I brought upon Jerusalem and all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when they see your ways. You see their ways and you know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it. So God's going to still have a remnant. He always has those who are faithful those who love him. We don't know how many there are, but a remnant is usually a small amount. Ladies, did you ever make a garment? Or even men, did you ever cut a pattern for a dress? And then what do you have left over after you have your particular piece that you're going to use? You have some scraps, some remnants. Uh, sometimes you can save them and make something else. Sometimes you have to toss them out. But God says, even though most people are going to be destroyed because of a lack of loving me, because of idolatry, there'll always be a remnant. He says um, that straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And few, few there be that find it. That's the remnant. Fear not little flock, little flock. It's the remnant. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May you be part of that remnant. Uh, and statistics in this country show it, and they're worse in other nations. Uh, the Barna reports came out, I think, about a year ago. Barna is a Christian uh, pollster. And uh, they had 10 questions set up for people about uh, their faith. Did they read the Bible regularly? Did they believe that Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation? Did they uh, uh, serve others and attend church and what have you? And based on those questions, they determined that those were probably the best determination they could come up with to find out who truly was born again with a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And the number came out to be um, quite small, well under 10% of those who had taken that test. Some went to church occasionally, some read the Bible occasionally, some went regularly but didn't believe everything in the Bible was true or that Jesus was the only way to the Father. But putting it all together, it was a small percentage. Um, and then, as we also know, Barna did a study nationwide, and uh, I think another pollster did the same thing about areas in the country. And we have the area here which is the least spiritual in the whole United States. Uh, under 10% of the people in this area believe that God's word is the infallible word of God to be followed uh, for eternal life and believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Less than 10%. That's pretty small. And uh, we've got our work cut out for us, to be sure. Well, verse 15, uh, chapter 15 now talks about the uh, outcast vine. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any other wood? The vine branch, which is among the trees of the forest. Is wood taken from it to make any object? Or can men make a peg from it to hang any vessel on? Instead, it's thrown into the fire for fuel. The fire devours both ends of it. The middle is burned. Is it useful for any work? Indeed, when it was whole, no, one, no object could be made from it. 
how much less will it be useful for any work when the fire has devoured it and it's burned? So he's using an illustration from their nature at that time. They go to a, a, um, a vine. Have you ever seen the vine branch? you ever seen the wood? It's good for nothing. You couldn't make a peg out of it. It's not strong. It can hold the grapes. That's about all it's good for. Without any grapes on it, it's good for nothing. What do you do with it? You burn it. So verse 6, Therefore thus says the Lord, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I will give up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So even as that vine has no value as far as its wood is concerned, these inhabitants have no value as far as I'm concerned because they do not love me. They do not care for me. They will meet the same fate as that wood. They will meet the fire, which will be the lake of fire. I will set my face against them. They will go out from one fire, but another fire shall devour them. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. Thus I will make the land desolate because they have persisted in unfaithfulness, says the Lord. So here is a, a very clear picture of the judgment that's going to come on the nation of Israel because of idolatry. Putting something or someone ahead of God. What's the passion in my life? What's the most important thing? What is so important that I cannot read God's word daily? What's so important that I can't give him the first tenth of my income, but I've got to spend it on my own uh, needs and desires? What is it that keeps me from wanting to serve people? I, I don't want to use my car to pick up people to go to church. I, I don't want to bake a pie or even buy a pie to give to somebody. I don't have the time to help people out. You know, the Lord helps those who help themselves. Let them take care of themselves. And we have these kinds of arguments within our hearts which are not from God. Jesus said quite to the contrary. When you reach out and you touch somebody, you visit somebody in prison, you visit, visit in the hospital, you're doing it not only for them, for me, but you're doing it to me personally. You are paying a visit to me by taking care of them. And so we are our brother's keeper. We are to look out for others. And it really doesn't come just from good works. It comes from a heart relationship with God. When I can't reach out and help somebody else, when I can't serve, that's idolatry. I found now that I've been married three and a half years to the most wonderful family, a beautiful wife with six kids, three grandkids, eight dogs, four cats, and a partridge in a pear tree, I think. Um, I find that most days go well for me, but sometimes I get down and I'm thinking I'm giving out more than I'm getting and I'm getting tired of this and we're going over the same nonsense, we're not making any progress and that's when I realize I'm having a pity party and I've got somebody on the heart who shouldn't be there and that heart is me. And so I say, get off the throne, you're not here to be served, you're here to serve. You're here to provide for others, to help them. Same with the church. Well, we go around and around. We don't get any place. You know, I've been pastoring 35 years. I've had three church splits. Why would I want to go on and pastor some more just to have another church split? Who needs all this nonsense? So we have to stop and say, wait a minute. That's all about self. That's all about uh, what I want and don't want. Watch your prepositions when you get into sin. I, me, my that shows we're going down the trail of who's on the throne of my heart. I am. But it should be you, Lord, and others. And uh, so we need to make an assessment. Is there idolatry in my heart? What's keeping me from putting God first? First of all, do I even know God? Do I really know him through Jesus Christ? And are my sins forgiven? And a lot of folks can't answer that question in the right way. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, he said, and that's through blood. God said that in order for forgiveness of sins to be taken place, there has to be the shedding of blood. And so in the Old Testament, they had animal sacrifices. Picturing the covering of sin and how awful sin is, you had to take your animal to the door of the temple and you had to cut its throat and transfer the sins to that animal in order to cover those sins for one year uh, for the Day of Atonement, or even throughout the year. And uh, God says, no, the, the animal blood is not sufficient. It will not cleanse from sin. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. Yesterday was the most holy day for the Orthodox Jews. Uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I saw some of the Jewish uh, families walking to synagogues. And um, I was reading about the fact that uh, the most Orthodox Jews recognize that it takes more than just being nice. The average Jewish person for the Day of Atonement tries to be nice. 
thinking that's going to somehow outweigh some of the sins of your life. If I'm better today, maybe that'll offset the not being better another day. The Orthodox Jews take it one step further. They take a chicken, a live chicken. They wave it over their head and transfer the sins of their lives to that chicken and then cut its throat and uh, either eat it or give it away to somebody else. That's how they get rid of their sins, trying to think back to the Old Testament days of the lamb in the temple. Well, there's no temple, and they don't do it with a lamb, but they're doing it with a chicken, thinking that's going to take care of their sins. And God says, no, it will not. The blood of bulls and goats will not cleanse from sin. Only the precious blood of the righteous Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to ask ourselves, is the blood of Jesus Christ on my heart today? It's on the throne of heaven. It's on the articles of, of uh, the tabernacle in heaven. But is it on my heart today? And if it is, then praise God, I am saved. But now I need to realize that I am saved to serve. I am to help others, to serve others, and put them first. So with our hearts uh, uh, pointed towards the Lord, for those of you watching by YouTube and television, if you would join us, let's examine our hearts and see if we know the Lord and invite him into our hearts and ask him to search out those idols in our lives, to be free of them, to now serve the Lord as we never have before. Father, we're grateful for this study today from Ezekiel. And we know that there is judgment for those who will not come to you through Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for members of our families who are held captive by the enemy, captive by their own sins and their own idolatry. Free them, Lord. Free sisters and brothers and uncles and aunts and others who do not know you. Satan, release them by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we're going to ask you to forgive us for our sins. We invite you, Lord Jesus, to come into our hearts. Live your life in us. Forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us by the precious blood. And then, Lord, as you got on your hands and knees on that last night, when all those disciples were so full of themselves about who was going to be the greatest, you became the servant and you washed their feet. And you said, what I have done to you, you do likewise. Teach us to wash the feet of one another and people will know that we have been with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Reach out.